Welcome back to Navigating an Abundant Retirement Radio. I am your host, Carol Dewey, and this week we're going to answer the question that I've been fielding all week from my clients, which is, is my money safe? After the Silicon Valley Bank's stunning collapse became the second largest bank failure in U.S. history, many consumers are wondering if their money is safe and if they have to worry about cash stored in their bank. Earlier this week, CNN Business wrote an article, Is My Money Safe? How Secure Is the Banking System? Your Silicon Valley Bank Fallout Questions Answered. In short, they remind us that if you have less than $250,000 in your account, then you almost certainly have nothing to worry about. That's because the U.S. government insures the first $250,000 in eligible accounts. Unfortunately, many SVB customers had much more than the $250,000 deposited, and now that they can't get their money, some companies are struggling to make payroll. So it's important to understand what is safe, and the best way to answer that is, what does safe mean to you? So let's talk about that. The U.S. regulators don't want to repeat of what happened in 2008. So Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, Federal Reserve Chairman uh, Jerome Powell, and the FDIC Chairman Martin Grunberg came together to say, look, even the uninsured money will be covered. The government is going to step in and essentially insure all the depositors beyond the regular limits of insurance, whether that's a good step or not for the long term. And we can talk about that, but certainly for the people who had their money in the bad bank, it's a good thing. Whether it's a good thing for the long term, again, is questionable. The Silicon Valley Bank is the largest bank failure since 2008. And fundamentally, the genesis of it is, you understand that one of the things that lit the fuse, if you will, and accelerated the issue is the rising interest rate environment. And they found that since... Then 89% of bank deposits were uninsured during that time, as of the end of 2022. Certainly, the federal government can't insure all of them. This got me thinking about where do people have their money? If you think about it, there are really only three main places people can put their money, the banks, insurance companies, and Wall Street. For our discussion today, we're talking about your safe money. So we'll take a look at the banks and insurance companies. For those of you listening on our podcast, I have a graph and I'm showing that uh, illustrates since the year 2000, the number of banks have literally dropped in half um, in the years from 2000 to 2021. Yet the number of insurance companies for the same time frame have remained somewhat steady and have only gone down slightly. As of 2021, which is the last data available, there are roughly 4,200 banks compared to the 737 insurance companies in the U.S. So there are five times as many banks as there are insurance companies. What's really interesting is that there are 25 times more failures among banks than there are the life insurance and annuity companies. I'm sharing another graph that shows there were 512 bank failures since 2008 compared to the 20 insurance companies during that same time period. What's even more interesting is I would bet that you've probably never heard of any of the names of the insurance companies that failed. I've got a list of the 20 here for those who can see the presentation. So I'll just name a few. Sea Change Health Insurance Company, California, Lumberman's Mutual Casualty Company, Illinois, Universal Healthcare Insurance Company, Florida, Medical Savings Insurance Company was Indiana, Co-Opportunity Health in Iowa. Again, just to name a few. Have you ever heard of any of these? Well, what you'll find from an insurance standpoint is that these are small, not very large companies, and those are the only companies since 2008 that went under. There is a good reason for the significant difference between bank failures and insurance company failures. In addition to the state laws governing insurance companies, there are guarantee associations that come in and provide huge protection for people. For the insurance companies, we'll take a look at the guarantee system at, just at a glance. There are guarantee associations in all 50 states, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. Each state's law is based on a model law developed by the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. 
There are minimum benefit levels in every state. Some states offer more protection than others, and the foundation of the coverage stretches across the nation. There are millions of policyholders and billions in benefits. Since the early 1980s, guarantee associations have provided protection to more than 2.65 million policyholders, guaranteed more than 26.8 billion in coverage benefits, and contributed approximately $9.1 billion toward fulfillment of insurer promises. Here's the safety net depending on your state for annuity benefits for those who can see the slide. For those who can't, I'll summarize up to $250,000 for most states, $300,000 for some, and there's some up to a half a million dollars. Looking at the same information for life insurance, net cash surrender value, and net cash withdrawal values, we're seeing up to 100,000 for most states, 300,000, and again, up to a half a million dollars. Let's not forget about life insurance death benefits, where we see up to 300,000 for most states and up to 500,000 as well for some states. In the financial discussions I have with people, I always challenge them to think about the difference between banks, which are federally regulated, and as you can see, the federal government steps in with bailouts, and the insurance and annuity companies who are regulated by state insurance departments. Insurance companies also have to comply with state laws regarding insurance policies and investments. So for banking institutions, it's all about the minimums. What we found in the life and annuity world is that they're about reputation protection. In other words, if you lose confidence in the life insurance and annuity industry in that segment, then it's detrimental to the whole of the industry. Therefore, they are committed to keeping your confidence up as opposed to the federal government having to step in and bail out the banking institutions. If there was a problem, the insurance companies bail themselves out. An interesting did you know fact, many of the large banking institutions such as Bank of America hold cash value life insurance as one of the most significant assets on their balance sheets, even as it compares to real estate and stocks. The FDIC actually allows banks to consider cash values in life insurance to be tier one investments right alongside gold and silver. Banks are the largest owners of permanent life insurance along with public corporations. What we really need to talk about are what are your investment risks and what are your options and should you be sticking cash under your mattress? Let me ask you, when you think about your money, do you want somebody who's going to go the minimum or do you want someone who has all the reasons and the motivation in the world to make sure that you're made whole? Who wants minimums? I don't want minimums. I don't just want a safety net. I want to get all of my money back. Now, in the case of SVB, the government is going to make the depositors whole above and beyond the insured amounts. And they're trying to tell us, the taxpayers, that it isn't going to cost us anything. At the end of the day, you have a federal government with $30 trillion in counting of debt. Where does their money come from? You may not be aware of this, but the top 10% of income earners pay 70% of the tax bill, which means you and I are bailing them out. The message they are sending here is that you can make all the bad decisions you want and fail because we'll just step in and bail you out. What happens when you do that with your kids? Something to really think about. In times like these of great uncertainty, I say there is no bad news and there is no good news. There is only news. There are tools and strategies at our disposal to allow you to protect your assets and be able to take advantage of times like these now and in the future. I invite you to get the answers you need about your financial plan in one of our exploratory meetings to receive the benefits of a valuable fiduciary second opinion, a net retirement income analysis, a social security maximization report, a blueprint of your current portfolio, a tax consultation through the four stages of retirement, or an estate planning review. Schedule your consultation now. There's no obligation. That's all I've got planned for you this week. Until next time, remember that navigating your abundant retirement starts today. I'd like to encourage you to continue our journey of enlightenment and education by subscribing to our podcast and downloading the show. See you next week.